Reason and Revolution by Herbert Marcuse, Part 2, The Rise of Social Theory, Chapter uh, 1.6, The Foundations of the Dialectical Theory of Society, The Analysis of the Labor Process. Marx rests his theories on the assumption that the labor process determines the totality of human existence and thus gives society its basic pattern. It now remains for him to give the exact analysis of this process. The early writings took labor to be the general form of man's struggle with nature. Labor is at first a process between man and nature, a process in which man mediates, regulates, and controls the material reactions between himself and nature by his own action. In this respect, labor is basic to all forms of society. The capitalistic ordering of labor is designated in Marx's early essays as alienation and hence as an unnatural, degenerated form of labor. The question arises, how has such a, de a degeneration become possible? And this is more than a questio facti, since alienated labor appears as a fact only in the light of its abolition. The analysis of the prevailing form of labor is simultaneously an analysis of the premises of its abolition. In other words, Marx views the existing conditions of labor with an eye to their negation in an actually free society. His categories are negative and at the same time positive. They present a negative state of affairs in the light of its positive solution, revealing the true situation in existing society as the prelude to its passing into a new form. All the Marxian concepts extend, as it were, in these two dimensions, the first of which is the compl complex of given social relationships, and the second, the complex of elements inherent in the social reality that makes for its transformation into a free social order. This twofold content determines Marx's entire analysis of the labor process. We shall now deal with the conclusions he draws. In the prevailing social system, labor produces commodities. Commodities are use values to be exchanged on the market. Every product of labor is, as a commodity, exchangeable for every other product of labor. It has an exchange value that equates it with all other commodities. This universal homogeneity, by which all commodities are equated with all others, cannot be ascribed to the use values of commodities, for, as use values, they are exchanged only insofar as they are different from one another. Their exchange value, on the other hand, is a purely quantitative relation. As exchange value, one kind of use value is worth as much as another kind, if taken in the right proportion. The exchange value of a palace can be expressed in a certain number of boxes of shoe blacking. Vice versa, London manufacturers of shoe blacking have expressed the exchange value of their many boxes of blacking in palaces. Thus, entirely apart from their natural forms um, and without regard to the specific kind of wants for which they serve as use values, commodities in certain quantities equal each other, take each other's place in exchange, pass as equivalents, and in spite of their variegated appearances, are all of a piece. The reason for this homogeneity must be sought in the nature of labor. All commodities are products of human labor. They are materialized labor. As embodiment of, of social labor, Sorry, all commodities are the crystallization of the same substance. At first, this labor appears to be just as diversified as the use values produced by it. Labor performed in the production of wheat is quite different from that used in the production of shoes or cannon. What in reality appears as a difference in use values is, in the process of production, a difference in the work creating those use values. If then the property common to all commodities is labor, it must be labor stripped of all qualitative distinctions. That would leave labor as the quantity of labor power expended in the production of a good. 
This quantity is indifferent to the form, content, and individuality of the labor. It is therefore ready for a purely quantitative measurement, equally applicable to all kinds of individual labor. Sorry, the standard... The standard of such measurement is given by time, just as the quantitative existence of motion is time, so the quantitative existence of labor is labor time. If all specificity of labor is abstracted, one act of labor is distinguished from another only by its duration. In this abstract universal form, labor represents the common property of all commodities that becomes constitutive of their exchange value. Labor creating exchange value is abstract general labor. But even a time measurement of labor still leaves an individual factor. The amount of labor time spent by different workers in the production of one and the same kind of commodity varies according to their physical and mental condition and their technical equipment. These individual variations are cancelled in a further step of reduction. The labor time is computed for the average technical standard prevailing in production. Hence, the time that determines exchange value is socially necessary labor time. The labor time contained in a commodity is the labor time necessary for its production, i.e. it is the labor time which is required for the production of another specimen of the same commodity under the same general conditions of production. Marx thus comes to the fact that the phenomenon of labor covers two entirely different kinds of labor. One, concrete specific labor, correlative to concrete specific use values, carpentry, shoemaking, agricultural labor, etc., and two, abstract universal labor, as expressed in the respective exchange values of commodities. Every single act of labor in commodity production comprises both abstract and concrete labor, just as any product of social labor represents both exchange value and use value. The social process of production, however, when it determines the value of commodities, sets aside the variety of concrete labor and retains as the standard of measurement the proportion of necessary abstract labor contained in a commodity. Marx's conclusion that the value of commodities is determined by the quantity of abstract labor socially necessary for their reproduction is the fundamental thesis of his labor theory of value. It is introduced not as a theorem, but as the description of a historical process. The reduction of concrete to abstract labor appears to be an abstraction, but it is an abstraction that takes place daily in the social process of production. Since it is the theoretical conception of a historical process, the labor theory of value cannot be developed in the manner of a pure theory. It is a well-known fact that Marx considered the discovery of the twofold character of labor to be his original contribution to economic theory and to be pivotal for a clear comprehension of political economy. His distinction between concrete and abstract labor allows him insights to which the conceptual apparatus of classical political economy was necessarily blind. The classical economists designated labor as the sole source of all social wealth and overlooked the fact that it is only abstract, universal labor that creates value in a commodity-producing society, while concrete particular labor merely preserves and transfers already existing values. In the production of cotton, spinning, for example, the concrete activity of the individual worker merely transfers the value of the means of production to the product. His concrete activity does not increase the value of the product. The product, however, does appear on the market with a new value in addition to that of the means of production. This new value results from the fact that a certain quantity of abstract labor power, that is, labor power irrespective of concrete form, has been added in the process of production to the object of labor. Since the worker does not do double work in the same time, the double result, preservation of value and the creation of new value, can be explained only by the dual character of his labor. 
By the simple addition of a certain quantity of labor, new value is added. And by the quality of this added labor, the original values of the means of production are preserved in the product. The process in which labor power becomes an abstract quantitative unit characterizes a specifically social form of labor to be distinguished from that form which is the natural condition of human existence. Namely, labor as productive activity directed to the adaptive or the adaptation of nature. This specifically social form of labor is that prevalent in capitalism. Under capitalism, labor produces commodities. That is, the products of labor appear as exchange values. But how does this system of universal commodity production, which is not directly oriented to to the satisfaction of individual needs, tend to fulfill these needs? How do the independent producers know that they produce actual use values? Use values are means for the gratification of human wants, since every form of society must satisfy the needs of its members in some degree in order to maintain their lives, the use value of things remains a prerequisite to commodity production. Under the commodity system, the individual's needs are uh, the individual's need is a fraction of the social need made manifest on the market. The distribution of use values takes place according to the social distribution of labor. The satisfaction of a demand presupposes that the use values are available on the market, while the latter will appear on the market only if society is willing to devote a portion of its labor time to producing them. A certain amount of production and consumption goods is required to reproduce and maintain society at its prevailing level. The social need, that is the use value on a social scale, appears here as a determining factor for the amount of social labor which is to be supplied by the various particular spheres of production. A definite quota of labor time is spent in the production of machines, buildings, roads, textiles, wheat, cannon, perfumes, etc. Marx says that society allots the available labor time needed for these. Society, however, is not a conscious subject. Capitalist society provides for no complete association or planning. How, then, does it distribute labor time to various types of production in accordance with social needs? The individual is free. No authority may tell him how he is to maintain himself. Everyone may choose to work at what he pleases. One individual may decide to produce shoes, another books, a third rifles, a fourth golden buttons. But the goods each produces are commodities, that is, use values, not for himself, but for other individuals. Each must exchange his products for the other use values that will satisfy his own needs. In other words, the satisfaction of his own needs presupposes that his own products fill a social need. But he cannot know this in advance. Only when he brings the products of his labor to the market will he learn whether or not he expended social labor time. The exchange value of his goods will show him whether or not they satisfy a social need. If he can sell them at or above his production cost, society was willing to allot a quantum of its labor time to their production. Otherwise, he wasted or did not spend socially necessary labor time. The exchange value of his commodities decides his social fate. The form in which this proportional distribution of labor operates in a state of society where the interconnection of social labor is manifested in the private exchange of the individual products of labor is precisely the exchange value of these products and thus determines the proportional fulfillment of the social need. Marx calls this mechanism by which the commodity producing society distributes the labor time at its disposal among the different branches of production, the law of value. The different branches that have been made independent in the development of modern society are integrated through the market, where the exchange value of the commodities produced yields the measure of the social need they satisfy. The supplying of society with use values is thus governed by the law of value, which has which has superseded the freedom of the individual. 
He depends for the gratification of his needs on the market, for he buys the means for this gratification in the form of exchange values, and he finds the exchange values of the goods he desires to be a pre-given quantity over which he, as an individual, has no power whatever. Moreover, the social need that appears on the market is not identical with the real need, but only with solvent social need. The various demands are conditional upon the, pow- upon the buying power of the individual, and therefore upon the mutual relations of the different social classes and their relative economic position. The individual's desires and wants are shaped and, with the vast majority, restricted by the situation of the class to which he belongs, in such a way that he cannot express his real need. Marx summarizes this state of affairs when he says, The need for commodities on the market, the demand, differs quantitatively from the actual social need. Even if the market were to manifest the actual social need, the law of value would continue to operate as a blind mechanism outside the conscious control of individuals. It would continue to exert the pressure of a natural law, the necessity of which, far from precluding, would rather ensure the rule of chance over society. The system of relating independent individuals to one another through the necessary labor time contained in the commodities they exchange may seem to be one of the utmost rationality. One of the one of utmost rationality. In reality, however, this system organizes only waste and disproportion. Society buys the articles which it demands by devoting to their production a portion of its available labor time. That means society buys them by spending a definite quantity of the labor time over which it disposes. That part of society to which the division of labor assigns the task of employing its labor in the production of the desired article must be given an equivalent for it of other social labor incorporated in articles which it wants. There is, however, no necessary, but only an accidental connection between the volume of society's demand for a certain article and the volume represented by the production of this article in the total production, or the quantity of social labor spent on this article. True, every individual article or every definite quantity of any kind of commodities contains perhaps only the social labor required for its production, and from this point of view, The market value of this entire mass of commodities of a certain kind represents only necessary labor. Nevertheless, if this commodity has been produced in excess of the temporary demand of society for it, so much of the social labor has been wasted, and in that case, this mass of commodities represents a much smaller quantity of labor on the market than is actually incorporated in it. From the point of view of the individual, the law of value asserts itself only ex post. Waste of labor is inevitable. The market provides a correction and a punishment for individual freedom. Any deviation from the socially necessary labor time means defeat in the economic competitive struggle through which men maintain their lives in this social order. The guiding question of Marx's analysis was, how does capitalist society supply its members with the necessary use values? And the answer disclosed a process of blind necessity, chance, anarchy, and frustration. The introduction of the category of use value was the introduction of a forgotten factor, forgotten, that is, by the classical political economy, which was occupied only with the phenomenon of exchange value. In the Marxian theory, this factor becomes an instrument that cuts through the mystifying reification of the commodity world. For restoration of the category of use value to the center of economic analysis means a sharp questioning of the economic process as to whether and how it fills the real needs of individuals. Behind the exchange relations of capitalism, it shows the actual human relations, warped to a negative totality, and ordered by uncontrolled economic laws. Marx's analysis showed showed him the law of value as the general form of reason. In the existent social system, the law of value was the form in which the common interest, the perpetuation of society, 
asserted itself through individual freedom. That law, though it manifested itself on the market, was seen to originate in the process of production. The socially necessary labor time that lay at its root was production time. Just come up. You don't have to make a scene. Come on. For this reason, it was only an analysis of the process of production that would yield a yes or no answer to the question, can this society ever fulfill its promise, individual liberty within a rational whole? Marx's analysis of capitalist production assumes that capitalist society has actually emancipated the individual, that men enter the productive process free and equal, and that the process turns from its own inner rationale. Marx grants the most favorable conditions to civil society, disregards all complicating disturbances. The abstractions that underlie the first volume of capital, for example, that all commodities are exchanged according to their values, that external trade is excluded, etc., put the reality so that it conforms with its notion. This methodological procedure is in keeping with the dialectical conception The inadequacy between existence and essence belongs to the very core of reality. If the analysis were to confine itself to the forms in which reality appears, it could not grasp the essential structure from which these forms and their inadequacy originate. Unfolding the essence of capitalism requires that provisional abstraction be made from those phenomena that might be attributed to a contingent and imperfect form of capitalism. From the beginning, Marx's analysis takes capitalist production as a historical totality. The capitalist mode of production is a specifically historical form of commodity production that originated under the conditions of primary accumulation, such as the wholesale expulsion of peasants from their land, the transformation of arable soil into pasture in order to furnish wool for a rising textile industry the accumulation of large pools of wealth through the plunder of new colonies, the breakdown of the guild system when it met the power of the merchant and industrialist. There arose in the process the modern laborer, freed of all dependence on feudal lords and guild masters, but likewise cut off from the means and instruments through which he might utilize his labor power for his own ends. He was free to sell his labor power to those who held these means and instruments, to those who owned the soil, the materials of labor, and the proper means of production. Labor power and the means for its material material realization became commodities possessed by different owners. This process took place in the 15th and 16th centuries and resulted with the universal expansion of commodity production and a new stratification of society. Two main classes faced each other, the beneficiaries of primary accumulation and the impoverished masses deprived of their previous means of subsistence. They were really emancipated. The natural and personal dependencies of the feudal order had been abolished. The exchange of commodities of itself implies no other relations of dependence than those which result from its own nature. Everyone was free to exchange the commodities he owned, The first group exercised this freedom when it used its wealth to appropriate and utilize the means of production. Whereas the masses enjoyed the freedom of selling the only good left to them, namely their labor power. The primary conditions of capitalism were herewith at hand free wage labor, and private property in the means of commodity production. From this point on, capitalist production could go its course entirely under its own power. Commodities are exchanged by the free will of their owners who enter the market free of all external compulsion. In the full joy of knowledge that their commodities will exchange as equivalents and that perfect justice will prevail. Also, the exchange value of every commodity is determined by the necessary labor time required for its production, 
and the measurement of this labor time is apparently the most impartial social standard. What is more, production starts with a free contract. One party sells his labor power to the other. The labor time that goes into making enough commodities to reproduce the worker's existence. The buyer pays the price of this commodity. Nothing interferes with the perfect justice of the labor contract. Both parties are treated equally as free commodity owners. They deal with each other as on the basis of equal rights, with this difference alone, that one is buyer, the other seller, both therefore equal in the eyes of the law. The labor contract, the basis of capitalist production, is ostensibly the realization of freedom, equality, and justice. But labor power is a peculiar kind of commodity. It is the only commodity whose use value it is to be a source, not only of value, but of more value than it has itself. This surplus value created by the abstract universal labor, hidden behind its concrete form, falls to the buyer of labor power without any equivalent, since it does not appear as an independent commodity. The value of the labor power sold to the capitalist is replaced in part of the time the laborer actually works. The rest of this time goes unpaid. Marx's statement of the way surplus value arises may be summarized in the following argument, that the production of the commodity labor power requires part of a labor day, whereas the laborer really works a full day. The value paid by the capitalist is part of the actual value of the labor power in use, while the other part of the latter is appropriated by the capitalist without remuneration. This argument, however, if isolated from Marx's entire conception of labor, retains an accidental element. Actually, Marx's presentation of the production of surplus value is intrinsically connected with his analysis of the twofold character of labor, and must be interpreted in the light of this phenomenon. The capitalist pays the exchange value of the commodity labor power and buys its use value, namely labor. The value of labor power and the value which that labor power creates in the labor process are two entirely different magnitudes. The capitalist puts the labor power he bought to work at the machinery of production, The labor process contains both an objective and a subjective factor, the means of production on the one hand and labor power on the other. The analysis of the twofold character of labor has shown that the objective factor creates no new value. The value of the means of production simply reappears in the product. It is otherwise with the subjective factor of the labor process with labor power in action while the laborer, by virtue of his labor being of a specialized kind that has a special object, preserves and transfers to the product the value of the means of production. He, at the same time, by the mere act of working, creates each instant an additional or new value. The quality of preserving value by adding new value is, as it were, a natural gift of labor power, which costs the laborer nothing, but which is very advantageous to the capitalist. This property possessed by abstract universal labor, hidden behind its concrete forms, though it is the sole source of new value, itself has no proper value. The labor contract thus necessarily involves exploitation. The twofold character of labor, then, is the condition that makes surplus value possible. By virtue of the fact that labor has this dual form, the private appropriation of labor power inevitably leads to exploitation. The result issues from the very nature of labor whenever labor power becomes a commodity. For labor power to become a commodity, however, there must be free labor. The individual must be free to sell his labor power to him who is free and able to buy it. The labor contract epitomizes this freedom, equality, and justice for civil society. This historical form of freedom, equality, and justice is thus the very condition of exploitation. Marx summarizes the whole in a striking paragraph. The area within whose boundaries the sale and purchase of labor power goes on is in fact a very Eden of the innate rights of man. There alone rule freedom, equality, property, and Bentham. 
Freedom, because both buyer and seller of a commodity, save labor power, are constrained only by their own free will. They contract as free agents, and the agreement they come to is but the form in which they give legal expression to their common will. Equality, because each enters into relation with the other, as with a simple owner of commodities, and they exchange equivalent for equivalent. Property, because each disposes only of what is his own. And Bentham, because um, because each looks only to himself. The only force that brings them together and puts them in relation with each other is the selfishness, the gain, and the private interests of each. Each looks to himself only, and no one troubles himself about the rest. And just because they do so, do they all, in accordance with the pre-established harmony of things, or under the auspices of an all shrewd providence, work together to their mutual advantage for the common weal and in the interest of all. The labor contract from which Marx derives the essential connection between freedom and exploitation is the fundamental pattern for all relations in civil society. Labor is the way men develop their abilities and needs in the struggle with nature and history and the social frame impressed on labor is the historical form of life mankind has bestowed upon upon itself. The implications of the free labor contract lead Marx to see that labor produces and perpetuates its own exploitation. In other words, in the continuing process of capitalist society, freedom produces and perpetuates its own opposite. The analysis is, in this wise, an imminent critique of individual freedom as it originates in capitalist society and as it develops peri passu with the development of capitalism. The economic forces of capitalism, left to their devices, create enslave, enslavement, poverty, and the intensity of class conflicts. The truth... The truth of this form of freedom is thus its negation. Living labor, labor power, is the only factor that increases the value of the product of labor beyond the value of the means of of production. This increase in value transforms the products of labor into components of capital. Labor, therefore, produces not only its own exploitation, but also the means for this exploitation, namely capital. Capital, on the other hand, requires that the surplus value be converted anew into capital. If the capitalist were to consume his surplus value instead of reinvesting it in the process of production, the latter would cease to yield him any profit, and the incentive of commodity production would vanish. Accumulation resolves itself into the reproduction of capital on a progressively increasing scale, and this in turn is rendered possible only by a progressively increasing utilization of labor power for commodity production. Capitalist production on a progressively increasing scale is identical with exploitation developing on the same scale. The accumulation of capital means growing impoverishment of the masses, increase of the proletariat. With all these negative features, capitalism develops the productive forces at a rapid pace. The inherent requirements of capital demand that surplus value be increased through increase in the productivity of labor, rationalization, and intensification. But technological advance diminishes the quantity of living labor, the subjective factor, used in the productive process, in proportion to the quantity of the means of production, the the objective factor. Um, I fell asleep. The objective, oh, the objective factor increases as the subjective factor decreases. This change in the technical composition of capital is reflected in the change of its value composition. The value of labor power diminishes as the value of the means of production increases. The net result is an increase in the organic composition of capital. With the progress of production goes an increase in the mass of capital in the hands of individual capitalists. The weaker is expropriated by the stronger in the competitive struggle and capital becomes centralized in an ever smaller circle of capitalists. 
free individual competition of the liberalist stamp is transformed into monopolist competition among giant enterprises. On the other hand, the increasing organic composition of capital tends to decrease the rate of capitalist profit since the utilization of labor power, the sole source of surplus value, diminishes in ratio to the means of production employed. The danger of the falling rate of profit aggravates the, co- the competitive struggle as well as the class struggle. Political methods of exploitation supplement the economic ones, which slowly reach their limit. The requirement that capital be utilized, that there be production for production's sake, leads, even under ideal conditions, to inevitable disproportions between the two spheres of production, that of production goods and that of consumption goods, resulting in constant overproduction. The profitable investment of of capital becomes increasingly difficult. The struggle for new markets plants the seed of constant international warfare. We have just summarized some of the decisive conclusions of Marx's analysis of the laws of capitalism. The picture is that of a social order that progresses through the development of the contradictions inherent in it. Still, it progresses, and these contradictions are the very means through which occur uh, a tremendous growth in the productivity of labor, an all-embracing use and mastery of natural resources, and a loosing of hitherto unknown capacities and needs among men. Capitalist society is a union of contradictions. It gets freedom through exploitation, wealth through impoverishment, advance in production through restriction of consumption. The very structure of capitalism is a dialectical one. Every form and institution of the economic process begets its determinate negation, and the crisis is the extreme form in which the contradictions are expressed. The law of value which governs the social contradictions has the force of a natural necessity. Only as an internal law and from the point of view of the individual agents as a blind law does the law of value exert its influence here and maintain the social equilibrium of production and the turmoil of its accidental fluctuations. The results are of the same blind sort. The falling rate of profit inherent in the capitalist mechanism undermines the very foundations of the system and builds the wall beyond which capitalist production cannot advance. The contrast between the abundant wealth and power of a few and the perpetual poverty of the mass becomes increasingly sharper. The highest development of the productive forces coincides with oppression and misery in full flood. The real possibility of general happiness is negated by the social relationships posited by man himself. The negation of this society and its transformation become the single outlook for liberation.